Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 311th episode of Real Hawk Talk. I am Brian Nemhauser, and you can find me on Twitter at Hawk Blogger. It is so fun after doing all these solo shows in the morning to get back with the fam, the crew that is the Real Hawk Talk crew from all across uh, the, the in at least the United States and Canada, the, the northern continent here. Uh, we've got Nathan Ernst at Nathan E11 with his, you know, mic all dialed. We are like good internet. Like Nathan is back in full force, ready for draft season. I feel like I haven't had a chance to talk to you for a while, man. How are you doing? Pretty good. Uh, don't love being jinxed right off the bat, but oh, uh, I have hopefully... full confidence. Okay. Okay. All right. Now I'm nervous. <laughs> so I've got like expectations to live up to. But how, how are you, you doing? Do. It has been a minute since we've chatted. I'm doing well. Yeah, I just got back this afternoon from Hood Canal. First time I'd ever gone to Hood Canal. I'd been on the peninsula before, but hadn't specifically been that part. Uh, really, you know, beautiful part of the state. It was pretty cool. And um, if, I, if I didn't have Nate with me, I would have gone for some some hikes. But uh, otherwise, we just uh, enjoyed the view, enjoyed the hot tub. You know, uh, it was good. It was good. Yeah. My uncle has a, a house on Hood Canal. It's nice. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Do you have any do you have any summer travel that the Ernst family is is planning? You guys got any trips in mind? We do a variety of just little things. So like Leavenworth, Seaside, Cannon Beach, uh, Chelan are all kind of staples. We're doing a Silverwood trip. Uh, that's What's Silverwood. Silverwood is an amusement park uh, right like north of Coeur d'Alene. Uh, so I, I have a lot of family in Spokane. So Silverwood was like a regular thing when I was a kid, but I haven't been in like 20 years. So uh, it'll be good, cool to go back with, uh, I'm going with my cousin and his kids and our kids and it'll be cool. Nice. Nice. Well, you hit, like you were mentioning, like almost every place you're talking about is among my favorite places. I still feel like as much as Leavenworth, people talk about it. It's a fun, it's, it's still slept on a little bit. I, I managed to watch some movie pretty stupid movie i think it was with allison brie and someone else that ended up taking place in leavenworth really like, yeah <laughs> literally look at they went it was whole scenes of like romping through leavenworth and i was like all right it's kind of a bonus part of this movie but i wouldn't recommend the movie in general but it was fun, fun seeing leavenworth um uh also who has the travel bug is dana o'gorman at dana og on twitter Dana, I think I saw some images of you that were not doctored of you and Evan Hill in the same place. Is that is that right? It is correct. I went to Phoenix to to visit some family, and Evan and I met up in person for the first time. So we've been doing this. I've been doing this podcast what three plus years now, and so it's like wow, it's about time. And we had a blast. Let me tell you. Yeah, I, I expected us to you know spar a little bit because that's what we do on the show. But we had a great, we had a great time. It was really nice to see him. Now, did he make you eat anything that you regret? No. Did he make you sign some oath of allegiance to a, a burger no. joint or no, something else? No, yeah. Uh, no, although there was a little bit of food talk, but it wasn't anything too crazy. But no, um, he recommended this um, brewery we went to, and it was really good beer. So, And he seemed well-known in the place. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah it was it was great we had a great time we sat there and chatted for a couple of hours it was really nice well that's great to hear and it's also um not surprising that there is a bar where people like <laughs> have cheers oh, evan. Yeah. evan and everybody knows his name so that's uh that's that's good for evan he needs yeah. he needs that kind of support in his life right. um Last but certainly not least, uh, Jeff Simmons at Real Jeff Simmons. Jeff, I, I wanted to tell you there is, I was literally just reading an article before I came on. And I don't know about all of you, but I will do just about anything to avoid having to like sign up for access to articles and stuff like that. And I say that as someone who's telling everyone to join, like, patreon and youtube constantly fully aware so like I, i'm like fully aware of both sides of this <clears throat> um but like i wanted to read this article from arif hans uh, is that right did i get that right <laughs> i want to make sure i'm quoting the right person um i think it was arif anyway 
um hassan i think it is uh anyway he wrote about the best and the worst mock drafts um over the last like five years at least 2016 to 2021 i think he didn't want to go later than that because he wants to give draft classes time to actually mature and he also did the top 100 you know big boards and bottom 100 do you want to have any guess about one of the most well-known draft analysts that consistently was one of the five worst mock drafts in, in a reef's research i used to do a mock draft for hawkblogger.com i wonder if i'm on there um i didn't see okay i don't know who you're referring to tee it up for me well this is a guy that i know you've had some issues with in the past his name people should know it is tony pauline um oh sports kita uh I, I think it's sports kita and i don't even know what the hell that is but that's where he's affiliated at this point and he was in the bottom i think he was ranked third worst at mocking drafts from 16 to 21. And this is, it's not like he's an NFL analyst in general that I've seen. He's only essentially known as a draft analyst and apparently not so good at it. I cannot say I am surprised by that. Um, this time of year, it's really, really important. People are, there's a lot of stuff being thrown against the wall, knowing who's the good people to know and like credibility and, Tony does a good job with like things like tracking 30 visits and tracking like the, the cycles of what's going on at like this time of year. If you tracked his Seahawks reporting in the last two years, it is atrocious. And what's made it so funny is how bad it's been. Is because John Boyle's come out with that article that goes like inside the draft room. And if you compare Tony's reporting on the Seahawks to like the John Boyle article, it is laughably bad. So, like, the 2022 one, I remember this pretty well. Tony reported, like, the day before the draft, the Seahawks were desperately trying to trade down to get Trevor Penning. Trevor Penning already, who's now being essentially replaced by the Saints. And they want to trade up to get Desmond Ritter at the end of the first round. It was Desmond Ritter. I remember that so well. The Seahawks had two second-round picks that year and a third-round pick. And they passed on Ritter twice in the second round, took Abe Lucas in the third round. So, for a guy they were... Desperately trying to trade up for. They didn't take him in the second or third round. And then I remember on draft night, he tweeted out the Seahawks were desperately trying to trade down at a nine. The whole story comes out that John Schneider was like sweating through his shirt to trade. Oh, he almost traded up to get Charles Cross. So that year it was like, oh my God. He was. And then last year, he comes back and we all fall for this. He had that like a story that came out that the Seahawks dream scenario was to take the center that Brian and I were kind of head over heels for uh, John Michael Schmitz. It was like, they, they might take him a pick 20. Like it was their dream scenario. If he gets to the second round, like Steve Hutchinson worked out him and the other center, they have two second round picks. John Schmitz gets through the second round. They pass on him twice. So <laughs> some of the worst reporting we've seen in every year, like I see all this, like Tony Pauline, Tony Pauline. If you actually attract his record, it's <laughs> remarkably bad. So Cannot say I'm surprised by the bottom five. <laughs> my, my theory on Pauline is that he happily uh, peddles misinformation for teams. I, I think he is intentionally uh, bad. <laughs> that would be he a is... little more respectable. So you're saying he is a draft worker? Um, is that what you're saying? Yes. Is there like is there some other connotation for that? I'm very old, Brian. I'm not young and hip. I don't know. What uh, Dana understood my about. my reference. I mean, okay. he's basically taking money for draft acts. Um, is is what you're saying? Yes. Like, yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. 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 I think that's a lot about money. Maybe he just <laughs> well, he's getting paid by somebody, Maybe. and it's not because he's good at what he does. So uh, before we move off uh, Arif's uh, article, I'm going to have to reach out and see if I can get him on the show. But um, anybody want to wager who was best, number one, at their top, at their big boards, top 100 prospects from 2016 to 2020, who performed the best? Nathan thinks <laughs> it's him. Definitely me, 100%. Okay, that's one vote for Nathan. Jeff, Dana, any guesses? If any of you guess this, I will donate 
a thousand dollars to Ben's fund? No idea. They're all usually so bad, like so bad. Like I know one guy who had like the best mock draft and like recording history was Josh Norris with like 16 picks one year. It's a good Ooh. guess, but no, but I, um, I think since then he's tanked, but there's videos. I had never, yeah. I had never heard of this one and I, I haven't even gone to the site to check it out. Um, the answer is draft board guru. Hmm. All one word, uh, his website. Um, I haven't even had a chance to look it up, but <laughs> he, he has been nails, um, from 2016 to 2021. So we will have to take a look and see what draft board guru says about the Seahawks, uh, picks in this, in this upcoming draft. If someone wants to pull that up, I see from one of our YouTube members, Hawks fan, Matt man asks if it was Rob Rang. Uh, good that you bring up Rob Rang. Rob was on the show recently and Rob was listed, but he was not among the top five overall. He did get a couple years. He got among the best five. I was surprised to see in a couple years, he got among the worst five. So he had a little bit of, you know, um, hit and miss. I think for the Seahawks, if it was just limited to the Seahawks, I think Rob would be consistently toward the top of, um, of the prognosticators. Um, so there was a couple other things that came out. Um, I, I'm curious. Uh, we can go all around. So we got to hear from Seahawks players today um, for the first time in, I don't know, it's been a while. And some of them, we didn't even get to hear from them during the season because they were hurt. So among the people we heard from, uh, Uchenna Nuosu, uh, who had been injured, was back. He had a quote that I th want to get your reads on. I'm not going to give you my read until you're all done, but um, his exact words, like, I want to see if I, I want to make sure I get this exactly right. One second. If someone has it up in front of them, let me know. But um, I'm going to get it from one of the most reliable reporters out there. Saying that sarcastically. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, where is it? Here it is. Uh, he has a quote that says, I think we've got the right coaches now. I think we've got the right coaches now. Dana, did you hear the full quote or did you just read it? Um, I, re I read it. I did not listen to it. Okay. Um, what was your reaction when you saw that? Um, I don't think my reaction was quite what everyone else's was because my first reaction was I was being a smart ass to you guy. I'm like, how the hell would he know? He's no, he met him for five minutes, you know, that sort of thing. I do think it's interesting that they're making these grand statements. A lot of the players did after such a short amount of time. But um, I don't think this was a slam against Pete. I, that wasn't the feel I got from it at all. Um, I think if it was a slam, it would have been more toward Clint Hurt or mm. maybe some of the position coaches, mm -hmm. um, or it could be him playing politician and getting in good with the new guys, which is totally okay. I'm, you know, he wants to keep his job. He likes Seattle. He doesn't want to go anywhere, you know? So I get that a little bit, but I know a lot of people were like, Ooh, like it was some like, you know, playground, you know, dig or something. But I did, I just didn't get that. I think if, if he was talking about the coaches, I don't think he was talking about Pete. I think he was talking maybe more a little down the line with the DC and the position coaches. Jeff or Nathan, did either of you guys hear like the, the more full quote uh, or like, did you hear Nuosu deliver that line? I did not. And I, I, uh, I don't know. I think the only person I've seen this is that very reputable porter, a reporter who um, likes his sound bites. Uh, so I actually, now that you're saying this, I really should go and look because it would not be the first time that I've had fun with a quote that he passed along that was not really representative of what was said. Jeff, We're talking about Greg Bell. Greg Bell sometimes <laughs> talks about this. He he uh, he <laughs> likes to get his likes on Twitter. So, I don't know why I'm trying to protect Greg Bell here. Uh, I, I, I didn't hear the. I didn't hear anyone speak today. I was okay. I was on the road, but I, I actually did read a story before our show. Bob Condota talked about like his full day there, and he had the full quote in writing. 
So he was pretty candid. He actually went a little deeper. He was talking about like he said. I think it started with like last year was really really frustrating. Um, like he's really happy about the changes. He's he said the end of last year. Like obviously he was just watching the defense fall apart. So that's why I do wonder. I have the same read as Dana. I wonder if that was pointed towards Clint Hurt, the defense they were running, that the defense wasn't playing well, and it's hard. Like we talked about the coordinators and how underwhelming they were, and you saw what happened to that Pittsburgh game. And like, that just looked like a team that was gutless. So I think, yeah, he, everyone's excited. It's their new day of work. They're all, it's, there's nothing, there's no, nothing to be upset about yet, but yeah, last year was as frustrating. It was an unwatchable team by the end of the season. So yeah, he was pretty pointed. Yeah. So I did have a chance to listen to it um, today. And cause I saw the quote and I saw the hubbub about it and I listened to it. If there hadn't been a tweet about it, I wouldn't have even caught it. <clears throat> I mean, I would have heard it and and like it would have registered, but it was very much a throwaway line. It, it was like a it, it was something he just kind of said offhand. And I don't think he even really was there was no emphasis to it. I'm um, sorry, I'm going to clear my throat. Um, So he did talk about being frustrated last year. Some of that was. He, he initially he said it was frustrated the last couple of years. And he's like, no, it was really just last year. And, you know, he talked about the, the one thing he did say about the coaches now is they're in the building, they're grinding. So I think he was more about what Dana was saying that he was looking for an opportunity to give some credit to the new coaching staff and build them up a little bit. Then he was trying to take a shot uh, at anyone else. I just, it's also just not his persona. The last third of his interview, you know, press conference was him talking about all the work he's doing in, in Africa, the charity, charitable work and building, like building, bringing back electricity and building roads and, you know, uh, workout facilities and all that. Like he's just, he's not a particularly inflammatory guy. So I, I definitely think Mr. Bell was, leveraging any i mean i guess you could say he was doing his job but it's one of the reasons why i have questions about the quality of work that comes out of that particular part of the beat um so i i didn't i didn't think it was that big of a deal something else that came out that was the first thing that most of the beat reporters like almost all of them took a picture and shared it out was that there's no longer a basketball hoop in side the whatever it's called area like the press conference area where the players do their meeting yeah the team meeting room yeah dana actually commented in our chat and she was furious about this and i was like i just don't get it josh cashman i'm gonna out him he was like oh my god here we go we've lost the meaning of what it means to be the seahawks you know, people across Seahawks Twitter, I think see Mike spin move Griff. If you're out there listening, I saw him, you know, sad about it. I saw a few people. Uh, anyway, it was, I was amazed, amazed at the amount of conversation going on about a friggin' basketball hoop. Dana, what's <sighs> you had a reaction, even though I know you were joking. <laughs> I was what, joking. What, what, what do you think this is about? Why are people so worked up? Because Captain No Fun is our new head coach. That's why. I mean, like, no, I'm just kidding. I really was just kidding when I said that. No, I think it was just such a staple of when we picture Pete as a head coach in the culture of Seattle, there was always the fun element, right? I mean, there was like always the jovial joking and it's like, no, we're taking that down. No fun. There's no fun here. And so I think people overreacted. Luckily, Tyler Lockett did let us know there is still a basketball hoop. It's just in a different place. But um, but yeah, I think it, it it kind of became a symbol of the culture a little bit. You know, think of all the famous people that have come through there and, you know, shot hoops with the team and that sort of thing. And and so I think that's where some of that came from. It was really overblown, though, I have to say, really overblown. Nathan, do you have any thoughts about this? Like, did you have a reaction when you saw it? I mean, I I would have never, I probably would not have ever like thought twice about it, uh, not noticed it was gone. But 
I do think it's interesting. Like a basketball hoop is big and you have to make a conscious decision to go ask one or more people because like I, also where it was like up on the stage, like to get it out, like it was not a small thing. So somebody was thinking we got to get this basketball hoop out of here. We have to go get some people and get it gone. And that is like, that. there's something interesting there. Uh, does it mean anything about the future of the, of the Seahawks? No, but it is a conscious, as conscious a decision as it was to put it in, it, it was every bit the conscious decision to take it out too. Do you think that there's any chance that has to do with the height of Mike McDonald and John Schneider, that they are, um, they, they have an issue with basketball as a sport? I, I do like the idea that uh, <clears throat> our Hobbit GM was, <laughs> insecure about a basketball hoop being in the facility uh i don't think i don't think mike mcdonald i saw that coaching the coach's photo with mike mcdonald and he's uh he's hunkier than i realized so i I doubt he has any kind of body insecurity (laughs) oh no i didn't know that we were gonna go that direction um we're talking about coaches we're always we are are talking about about you know how it works here uh there was a few other people that spoke ty lockett spoke uh julian love spoke um uh Ty Lockett talked about wanting to be in Seattle. Um the restructures deal. It said something about don't want to read anything more about him, you know, trade rumors. Were there any other quotes or any other like storylines that jumped out to any of you uh that you saw when when looking at what came out of um this afternoon's press conferences? I think the one thing that I kept seeing repeated by people over and over again, and I mean the players, was that the word new. Oh, everything is just so new. How's it going? Well, I don't know. It's brand new. I don't even know the playbook yet. You know, everything is new, new, new. And so I think they have a little bit of that first day of school itis too. It's like, yeah, we're here. And I know you guys want us to say something really impactful, but I haven't even opened the damn thing. I don't even know what it is, you know? And so I think that that was interesting. But it also made me think that maybe it's real new. Maybe it's real different. And so that'll be interesting to see what happens as as we progress into training camp. I'm just seeing as I'm looking on the the feed of Seahawks beat reporters, Corbin Smith and Jeff Simmons are Blue Jays fans. Uh, yeah, but I'm a self loathing Blue Jays fan. It's different, <laughs> and he's part of the problem. Y- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You were talking some smack about the Mariners, man. I mean, yeah, but that's, that was like, a that's like kicking an ugly baby. Like, it's it's like, why would you do that? It's because the Blue Jays have been so incompetent over the last like year and first month, and they look normal. And today, they today things came back to normal. The team I can't stand returned to form, and they blew a game. But that's just the optimism in the fan base. And there's actually a Seahawks fan that. I'm buddies with who's like the biggest optimistic BK who's like the most optimistic Blue Jays fan of all time. I, I always give him shit on the side, but he's funny. He's a good guy. I really like him, but I uh, just, I don't understand like the optimism that comes out of that fan base when like, so seeing Corbin like tweeting out all the Blue Jays positive stuff and just like <laughs> sent me into a dark place. <laughs> that sounds so, like body positivity, like Blue Jays positive. Like just, yeah, I like that. I and like there was that. like an indirect swipe at the Blue Jays. And everyone's like, oh, the Jays are back. I'm like, this team, the Mariners have been shit. Like we shouldn't be bragging about beating up on this crap yeah. team. And then today Cal Rowley uh, sends us back, but to where we belong. So, oh yeah. And your, your, your John Schneider was making fun of our Cal, our catcher last year. And it came back to bite him. We won't go farther into that, but what I, what I a like, lot of, yeah. What I like about Seahawks fans, at least the ones I've gone to know on the internet is we're always miserable at the same time. <laughs> and it's like, that's kind of my personality and like with sports. So Seahawks fans are rightfully miserable at almost at all times. Even when we do things, even when we're winning, we're miserable. Blue Jays fans don't quite fit like the Jeff mindset. So I tend to get more into the Seahawks fan base a little bit more. I like that. I like that. I, I do want to call out one other comment that, that jumped out to me that came from Geno Smith. Uh, I think it's worth Bringing up his stuff, uh, he said, quote, it was a terrible moment for him when Pete Carroll got fired. Uh, I think we all felt that, right? I mean, even folks, I was I was advocating for them to move on from Pete. But, uh, you know, 
I don't think any of us felt good at that moment that that decision was made. And for Gino, for, <clears throat> for the career he's had and for the, the chance that, that Pete gave him, you can understand that. He also said that he knows he has to prove himself. New coaching staff, old coaching staff have always got something to prove. I'm competing with Sam, Sam Howell. I know he's competing with me. Um, that's a quote that, from Brady Henderson, who I very much trust his uh, professionalism and how he chooses his quotes. I don't know. He's been slumming it lately. Some of the, the shows he's had to show. <laughs> that's up true. Yeah, that's true. I did pull him down to to our level in Hawk Blogger Morning Monday. That's true. Did Did Gino seem out of sorts at all to you? Like I only uh, listened to a little bit of of his stuff, and he like when he was trying to talk about you know the the new coaching staff and what they're bringing he and i couldn't tell if he was just like kind of vamping because it's all so new and he doesn't really know and he was just trying to give an answer or if he seemed a little just kind of flustered and then there was that comment like you said about you know talking about how pete getting fired was a terrible moment for him i did not get a chance to listen to gino's presser so i'm going to and i'll let you know but it wouldn't surprise me i i mean the guy has been given absolutely no support like almost the minimum possible support over this off season, even when they picked up his contract and like they passed, they caveated of like, well, it would be a silly thing. He's a quarterback make on a really affordable deal. Of course, we're going to keep him. And then we're going to try to see if we can trade him. Like it was a shitty off season for him. He lost his, his major supporter the people that are left and even the new guys, which seems the only reason they could have been saying the things they were saying about drew lock and kind of promoting drew lock more than Gino is because it's coming from John Schneider. So like his, he's kind of unwelcome in the, in his own home. And I, I'm pretty hopeful that will change once he and Ryan Grubb and Scott Huff get together. I still feel like that is a awesome match. I think anyone that watched, watch Michael Penix uh, Jr. in that offense the last couple of years had to see throws that Geno Smith has made. Like there's a lot of similarities there. So I think it's gonna be a great marriage, but yeah, it's, if I was him, I wouldn't quite know, you know, who I'm playing for me now. I'm really not playing for the team necessarily or for, or for the people that are paying me in the same way. And that's a, it's not a great, it's not a great setup. And it didn't have to be that way. Like there's zero, they could have done everything that they wanted to. They could have kept him, tried to trade him, tried to sign Drew Locke. They could have done all of that without making Gino feel like shit. And they just like almost for no reason chose to, to do that. So anyway, that, those are a couple things that, that kind of stood out for me. Um, worth, worth, uh, checking in on, um, other bits of news. So uh, I don't know how new this is, but there's been a bunch of like 30 visits going on and people have been asking about, okay, well, is it these top 30 visits, what does it mean? One, uh, for people that don't know, they are not top 30 visits. They are not the top 30 prospects. They are just, you get 30 visits for the draft. You can bring people in a lot of times they're for guys later in the draft. A lot of times they're for guys that didn't go to the combine. So they're almost the opposite of a top 30 visit. And they're wanting to get more met. Like they get medical, they get more medical uh, opportunity to investigate guys. They have, if there's a uh, character question or they want to ask them about like more about who they are so that they they're for all sorts of purposes, they can be for their top 30 prospects, but they're, they're often like all over the board. Um, a couple names, and so this is this is coming from Corbin, and so I don't know if this is official other places, but we know that Tavondre Sweat was due to come out for a visit tomorrow. Um, he said that Byron Murphy is also now scheduled for a visit to come out and visit the Seahawks. And the interesting thing there is that's one of the first guys I've seen that makes it that's made a 30 visit that they also met with at the Combine. Um, so we're starting to see guys that they might be doubling up on. Um, I've, first of all, did anyone else see any other mention of that or, you know, uh, anyone else got confirmation seeing shaking heads, assuming that that is true, Jeff, I'm curious your thoughts on, on that news. 
Uh, it's obviously a really interesting name. Uh, I think with him, it could be a number of things. Um, it could be there circling back on Tavondre Sweat. They could be trying to get information on him through a different source. They have Sweat in the building. Uh, Murphy's a guy that could just be looking at as a trade down, as a 16 pick. But it's hard to always pinpoint, like, is there a medical issue? Is it a personality thing? These are the things we're not always privy to. Like, we can we we sometimes know who have, like, personality questions, like Jane Carter last year. But with him, it could be someone they're looking at. It could be doubling up on something. So it's hard to say. Like, But, like, the names this week are all of a sudden a lot more driven towards, A, first-round picks, and, B, some of the guys we've thought have been logical fits. And you've seen Jared Verse. Has been he's going to be in, I think, yesterday and today or today and tomorrow. One of the two, he's going to be in. Byron Murphy is now apparently going to be in. Um, we've seen some of the quarterback names, Bo Nix and Rattler. And so the names are getting a lot more top heavy. And then Chop Robinson, I think, was in yesterday. So some of the guys that they could be looking at at 16, if the offensive linemen are gone, some of the guys they could be trading down for. So it's getting Murphy is a guy that could be an option at 16, it could be an option in a move down. So He's a very logical fit for Seattle. We've talked about it all off season. So hoping it's a positive visit. A couple other names that have come up. I think you're referring to first. Let's just talk quarterback for a second. Uh, Bo Nix and Spencer Rattler both came out as being names that the Seahawks were going to do a visit with Nathan. I haven't had a chance to hear your thoughts on this. First of all, do you have any points of view on either of those players? Spencer Rattler can really throw the football. That's about what I know about. I mean, I know Bo Nix. You are going to be on the top five list for the commentary on the draft. I mean, you can make fun of me for that, but that's literally what people like about Spencer Rattler. Like, that boy can throw a football. Like, I mean, uh, he has not done a lot else other than demonstrate incredible arm talent. So you're not a huge fan. Oh, I'm, I mean, as a project, like I'm seeing him like as a third, fourth round type guy. Yeah. Like, yeah, I think he's really interesting. Um, I, I would much prefer like him in a mid round pick uh, over either Penix or Knicks in, in the first round for sure. Got it. Uh, and then Knicks as well. Any if if let's say it's third round for either Rattler or Knicks, let's say that the story is I'll, I'll, I'm going to make this up, but I think there's potential truth to this. Jeff and I kind of talked about it this weekend, but one one thought is oh they're talking to Knicks because maybe they're going to try to they're going to draft him in the first round or or something along those lines. I think there's a chance that he's going to slide into the third and that he's always been a third round quarterback. And so that actually tracks if Spencer Rattler is also a third round. And maybe these are a couple quarterbacks that they're thinking about as third round selections, not as first round selections. If that was the case, big if, do you prefer one over the other? Uh, how old is Rattler? He's been around for a minute too. He's 23. He's, okay. But that's what, like, Four years younger than Nick's. I mean, Nick's is what is Nick's? Uh, <laughs> Nick's is twenty four. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, the arm talent really is cool with him, and he's a little younger. Um, certainly hasn't been in as conducive environments to succeed as Nick's has been. Um, so I think I would. Uh, I think I would be more interested in Rattler. I'm looking at there's some I mean you guys give Cooper Dejean De so much crap for his pictures. Spencer Rattler. <laughs> I'm not going to put him up here, but it's not He's great. a unique looking guy. It's I love Uh yeah, I mean they did talk to Jaden Daniels and uh Drake May at the combine, right? They did. Yeah, their combine. We haven't talked about their combine visits that much, but there's like I'll even pull up. I don't know if we're going to go through all of them, but there's a pretty long list. Um, and yeah, they talked to all pretty much the top quarterbacks. Um, yeah. So like they didn't meet with Caleb Williams because there's probably just no shot. Right. Um, they probably have really good info on JJ McCarthy that we know they have awesome info on Michael Penix. And then they've talked to Daniels, May, Nix, and Rattler, which kind of rounds out the top, six or however many that is so they've basically covered their bases on all the top quarterbacks yeah i'm looking through, through here 
I mean, some of the names that are interesting that that do break the Washington, Oregon, uh, sorry, Washington, Michigan, like, hey, we don't need to talk to them because we already know them. They met with Braylon Trice at the Combine. They met with Mike St. Estrill. They met with Zach Zinter. Um, so it's not like just because they went to one, they met with Chris Jenkins, they met with Junior Colson. So it's not like just because they have prior experience that they're not meeting these guys. Um, I'm just scrolling through anyone else. I mean, Graham Barton, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan lately on, on him. Uh, but yeah, I guess it's interesting to me that, that they, that they now have a couple of those quarterbacks. Dana. Schreiber, sorry. Yeah, go Schreiber ahead. was in Green Bay when they drafted Aaron Rodgers, right? Or is that predate him? Yeah. It was okay. there. So, like, I wonder, too, how much that still influences him. Because one of the things that was said when Rodgers started to fall is that he got into, like, the teens and stuff. And a lot of teams hadn't done their homework on him. And so they they just like that was partly why teams were shying away is because they just didn't think he'd be there and weren't really prepared to be ready to take him. But Green Bay was. Um, and so I wonder if that is like because we kind of see this now every year. And like obviously a lot was made of it with the rest stuff and Allen and Mahomes and some different things. But this is just like a pretty common thing for Schneider now to just always be looking at the top QBs. And not taking any of them. And not taking a single one of them. Yeah. Yep. Ever. Other than you're talking guy. a whole bunch about it. Just talking endlessly <laughs> about it, how cool it would be and how much he likes to do it. And yes. yeah. Yeah. Dana, let's say that they draft Spencer Rattler or Bo Nix in the third round. Okay. Okay. Not a first round pick, not a second round pick, third round. Who do you think the two quarterbacks are on the roster next year? Next season. So the 2025. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I don't think it's Gino. And that that just, I mean, we've talked about this a million times about how his contract, you know, it's just so friendly for the team, but why not keep him this year? Plus it gives them a year to figure out what they actually have in Sam Howell. Plus now this rookie, see if they can train him up a little bit. But if it's not a total disaster with those two, then I think that that would mean the end of Gino in Seattle without question. And the other point I was going to make about the 30 visits um, is that a couple of times when Seattle has traded for someone or when they have picked up someone in free agency, they will refer back to, well, we had them in for a visit during their draft year. And so I think to Nathan's point, that is true too. They keep these notes on these kids. They know who they are. They liked them when they talked to them and then, oh, boom, three years later, four years later, they show up as a free agent. Yeah, we're going to pick him up because we liked him the draft year too. So I think a lot of it is just fact-finding missions. They want to know who these kids are. They want to talk to them face-to-face. So doesn't mean that they're not interested in them. No, that's not it at all. It just means that they want to have as much information as possible. And you yeah. see it work on both sides. Like last year, mm-hmm. I know Pete was like blown away with Devin Witherspoon's football IQ when he was there. And that might have pushed him over the top. And then uh, Brady Henderson told a story on Brian's show. He didn't name any names, but he, he told a story of someone that came off their board because of how bad their 30 visit went. Yeah. So, so these things can make a big difference. Um, Just as a quick rewind. And for people that are curious, last year's 30 visits, at least the confirmed ones that we know about, Jalen Carter, Zach Pickens, Robert Cooper was signed as an undrafted free agent. Mm -hmm. Calvin Avery. I can't remember. Was he signed as an undrafted free agent? That name sounds familiar. I'm not sure. Will Anderson Jr., who pretty clearly they, you know, we've heard from Brady Henderson that that was the other player that they would not have moved from five if he was Mm -hmm. available. Uh, Yaya Diaby, Lucas Van Ness, Adi Adi, BJ Ojolari, Byron Young. Wouldn't that have been nice? Uh, Will McDonald, Nick Herbig, Devin Witherspoon. Heard of him. Kaylee Ringo, Jamie Robinson, Jordan Howden, Jarek Reed. Mm-hmm. Tatavius Martin, Trenton Simpson, who interestingly got picked by Baltimore, who Schneider has said multiple times they always snipe his picks and vice versa. Drake Thomas on offense. They talked to Braden Daniels, Jordan McFadden, Anthony Bradford, Tyler Steen, Jake Andrews, Daywan Jones. That would have been nice too. And Charlie Jones. So 
they don't have that many draft picks. A number of their picks showed up on the top 30 list, right? Um, I could go back to 2022. Boye Mafe was a 30 visit. Um, you know, I could go through all these, but you get the point. I think if they have a 30 visit, it is relevant. Um, it does mean that the team has a little bit more interest and they might get enough information in those visits to decide, yeah, we're going to make, we're going to make the, the call on this guy. Um, I am curious. I'm scrolling through to see if there's anyone else of, of note on the 2022 list. Um, so anyway, I, I thought that was interesting. I guess, Jeff, before we leave the, the quarterback thing, same kind of scenario I was talking about with Dana. So third round, they, they spend a pick. If Geno Smith goes out and just balls out this year and they have Spencer Rattler, let's say, and they have um, Sam Howell, what do they do? They do they really just cut Geno next year? Do they extend and trade? Do they like that wouldn't really necessarily make sense? Like, is it just no matter what Geno's gone next year from your perspective? No, I don't think so. I I think Geno has somewhat of a clean slate, but it's because of his age, because of his contract, kind of time's running out for him. So he would have to ball out. He would have to play at a level where you would just. He played a level where you have to bring him back, but it's a lot comes down. And maybe that's what Nathan was alluding to earlier. This is a huge season for him. If he wants to stay in Seattle, if he wants to, and also like you can draft a Rattler or a Knicks and they could come back and they could just be duds. So it's hard for you to say like, or how like they're going to have a whole year of information on Howell. So it's hard for us to just like guess at this point, like if they take a third round quarterback, like are they going to be Russell Wilson? Like, I don't know. Probably not, but uh, almost assuredly not. So a lot depends on a full year of these guys in the building. But when they drafted Russell, they had Tavares Jackson and Matt Flynn. A lot of people forget that Tavares Jackson was still around on that roster. So a lot of people thought the Howell trade might close the door on a quarterback. They still need that. They, I, I would not be surprised if they draft the quarterback in that middle part of the draft. I think the part of the Howell trade was them giving up on the idea of a first round quarterback. Um, all right. Uh, sorry, I got distracted. I thought I saw new news, but it was not. I think it is time to do patron questions. And before we do, let's just thank our patrons, patreon.com slash Hawk blogger. Folks have been supporting the show for years. New folks. We've got, you know, almost I think 40 new folks in the last few weeks that have joined. So a lot of fresh faces. Hopefully we're getting questions from new folks as well. Uh, patreon.com slash hawk blogger. You also bonus now you're getting every audio version of the hawk blogger mornings show, every uh mock draft madness that we do, every emergency pod. The audio versions are only available to Patreon members, and I'm getting those up the same day that we record them, so there's no delay. You get access, so you got to be a patron, patreon.com slash hawk blogger, and you get to ask us these questions every week, Dana. Who do we have asking us questions this week? All right. So we're going to start with Max. Uh, Max always asks good questions. Um, so it says a number of quality vet safeties remain unsigned. When do you see those safeties starting, start signing with other teams? And are there any vet minimum targets for Seattle? Nathan, what do you think on the vets? At this point, you got to think those guys are going to sit for quite a while. I don't know what the deadline is for. Um, uh, is picks. it? Yeah, the comp picks, right? Um, it's after the draft. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a lot of those guys, you know, if there hasn't been the interest to pick them up so far. Um, unlikely that they'll sign for probably a couple months still. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised, honestly, to see some of those guys sit till after week one. You know what I mean? Like, I could see that. Mm, I think they'll probably most teams like if not mall, but some. Chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But like, if, if anyone's like a serious candidate of making the team, you're going to want them in for your training camp oh, and yeah. everything. But yeah. All right. The next one is from More Bobo. Love that name. If Schneider were to take two of Pooney, Coleman, Zinter, and McCormick at picks 108 and 118. And addressed other needs earlier in the draft. 
Would that be enough attention given to the O-line? Seems like if you know at least those two, those two guys are coming, sorry, um, are in there in the fourth, gives flexibility to go um, BPA. Sorry. Best player available. Best player available. Yeah, player available earlier in the rounds. Um, Jeff, why don't you take this one? Sorry. I, I was know. hoping you'd give that one to Brian, actually. I, I saw oh, Brian. Brian. I saw him huh. start to smirk over there. So let's, let's keep, I'm going to pass this to Brian. No, no, like no. It. You, you don't have a, I mean, Jeff, I talk all the time. You sure okay. you don't want to? I'll yeah. give you a take. Um, I like a lot of the players mentioned on mm-hmm. that list. Can you give their full names, Jeff? Because I think not everyone knows. Like Dominic so, Pooney. Dominic Pooney's a guy that we've talked about a lot in our show. He can play all five positions on the O line. His range is like third, end of second, third round, fourth round, somewhere in there. The name I like the most on that list is Zach Zinter, who's like probably a second round prospect that broke his leg last year. So he's coming back from a broken leg. He was like a team captain in Michigan. Like uh, He just has every like quality to just be a good lineman. I, and I think Brandon Coleman's the guard with like the super long arms. He's had, he had really good film two years ago. This year he sort of dropped off a little bit. Is there any other names in there? There's one more name in there, Mason McCormick. Yes. Who's a good, he's an exciting prospect. I'm going to come out and say as much as I like all those names individually, I don't think that would be enough. I think that's doing exactly what you did last year. And this draft is deeper at guard, but my problem with how John Schneider drafts is he does things like that, where because there's deeper at certain positions, he waits for shelves and he waits for players. I think this line needs quality. I think they need a, a, a pick in the first three rounds. Like I've done mocks where you can even do two in the first three rounds. I don't think that's realistic. But I think you need a quality player in that, especially if Lucas, if he's not the guy he used Mm -hmm. to be. And Charles Mm -hmm. Cross has been fine. We're hoping he takes a step forward. But I think they need quality in that group. So I'd obviously be happy with one of those names in the fourth round. But I think if they do what they did last year and they pick up Bradford and Olua Timmy, who are good prospects, we were happy with both those picks when we did that show last year. I don't think it's enough, personally. I don't know if you feel differently, Brian. Oh, one, I mean, that that was a great great uh pull on all those prospects i just did my interior o-line show yesterday um so some of those names are a little fresher in my mind puni is a guy that we've talked about and after reading a little bit more about him i think he has higher upside than some of those other guys um, as an athlete as well as um a guy that's just developing um overall uh mccormick is a guy that i like quite a bit the, the biggest knock on him is, is just a little stiff. And so I think there's a little bit of athletic limitations in some of the stuff related to him. Brandon Coleman gets mentioned because he had unreal combine numbers. I mean, like 99th percentile testing, but he does not profile as a guy that's worth like anything more than like a sixth, seventh round pick most likely. And then, um, uh, the last guy that you mentioned was who? Oh, Zach Zinter. Yeah. Zinter's like, he is the classic. He will be a good guard in the NFL. Probably not a great guard in the NFL. Like athletically, he's not that gifted. And so, I mean, you could get probably a second round, uh, guard in maybe the third or fourth round because of his injury but who knows so i think he's he certainly be a nice guy to have but to your point jeff if you want to have a mediocre offensive line you just keep drafting guys with relatively high floors and relatively low ceilings and end up with a pretty uninteresting offensive line um so yeah at some point they need to find somebody maybe it's one of the guys they already have maybe abe lucas Maybe Charles Cross develop into an absolute blue chip offensive lineman. That does not look like the trajectory right now. So I would love to see them just take a bigger swing in the first round um, with that position. I don't know. We'll see if, if Schneider will do that. It, it seems so. Maybe, maybe he's just throwing us all off. Who knows? <laughs> just seems against the grain for him, for sure. All right. So this next question is from Colin. It's actually a question for me. Um, it says a question for Dana. Um, you had a great pod with Emery Hunt last night. He and you made some interesting insights about how last minute things, example, sweats DWI can affect draft boards in different ways and how teams have to adjust. Would you mind summarizing? Well, let, 
I giggle at this question a little bit because yeah, I did. So on the Archer football podcast last night, we had Emery Hunt, who is a fantastic draft guy. Like he's just the best, but I just love him. But we got into a little bit of a conversation and that conversation kind of had too many conversations. The first part of it was he was talking about what we were discussing earlier about how these um, interviews have so much more power sometimes than like a pro day or the combine. Like they want to get in there and they want to talk to someone and how any questions they might have come up. And we talked about Latu being um, medically retired and then he came back. You know, all of those type of questions are all cleared and the interviews are so, so important for that. The other part of the conversation was actually about Cooper Dijon. And it was funny because I brought up that he had been injured last year and how well he did at his pro day. He took it a different direction where he said the only reason why there's ever a question about Cooper is because he he doesn't have black grandparents. He said because he is a white cornerback, and it was hilarious to hear Emery say this, but because he's a white cornerback, they're bound and determined to turn him into a safety and turn him into something he isn't. He's like, there's nothing wrong. There's no questions about him. He's a great player. The only question that they have is the ones that they won't say out loud. And so it was a really interesting conversation about how um, – the league views him. But then the other part of that conversation was um, really, truly about how these interviews and talking to them and having the 30 visits where they can get their own medicals are way more important than someone's pro day. Uh, there was a reference to, to Marvin Harrison Jr., how he didn't do a pro day and how, you know, he wasn't doing some, a lot of this stuff. And, and Emery brought up a good point that for CJ Stroud's pro day last year, who did he throw to? Marvin Harrison. So he already had done a pro day. He didn't need to do it again. So it was an interesting conversation. And Colin, I appreciate you listening. That was very, very nice of you. So can I add one little bit to that? Please Dana? do. I think it's worth noting. We've talked about Cooper DeGene as potentially a safety pick for the Seahawks and mm -hmm. uh, respect Emery's call, you know, whether he is a safety <laughs> or not. But I don't see a single safety in any of the 30 visits or any of the combine visits for the Seahawks. Yeah. And so while I think that that's an area that they should be targeting in the draft, maybe they don't wait. Are you seeing someone, Jeff? Camp, Camp kitchens. Uh, yeah. Camp oh, kitchens. kitchens. That's right. That is the one guy. Yes. He was there yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. This list has not been updated, but you're right. He, he was, he was added to it. So not a lot, but th th at least there's one. That is interesting. Okay. <laughs> Sam Brown wants to know what our favorite Michael McDonald song is. And he doesn't mean our head coach. <laughs> <Just like Ooh. laughs> Nathan, do you even know he, who Michael McDonald is? Yeah, yeah. Is? He's got one. <laughs> um, what's the one he does with Thundercat? Uh, I mean, look, all the Steely Dan stuff is awesome. But uh, he's got, what's that? Show, show You the Way. Uh, oh, yes. I love that, I love that That's song. That's a good tune. I'll, I'll go with that one. All right. We'll leave that one there. There you go, Sam. We're not there. I'm way older than everybody else. And I didn't even know that one. So that's awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, there's another question for me. But I'm going to skip that one for now. Um, so Eric wants to know, does the current trend towards college plays stay, players, I think they meant, staying in school longer change the way you assess the trade-off between youth versus experience? And which do you favor? Also, does anyone have a favorite in the Masters? Nathan, I since I gave you a joke question, you go ahead and answer this one. Oh, I, I didn't. That was that's my favorite <laughs> a Patreon one. question ever. Uh, <laughs> I was so excited about it. I didn't listen to what you were saying. Oh, so see, look, it? look, that's okay. I would, I would be happy to. Does the current trend toward college players staying in school longer change the way you assess the trade-off between youth versus experience? And which do you favor? And does anyone have a favorite in the Masters? I think that's a golf thing. I don't do golf stuff, but I can. I don't do golf either. Uh, no, I mean, I think uh, when it comes to draft prospects, you know, the um, age is really important. And, you know, uh, I think John even talked about this, that Sam Howell's been in the league for two years and is younger than Bo Nix, Michael Penix, mm -hmm. maybe even younger than, than Rattler, um, younger than a lot of these guys. And so, like, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that these guys can't be as good as Sam Howell or whatever. But if you look at what Howell has already done in the NFL, like the likelihood that some of the, like, you know, Rattler or Nix or some of those guys will have even that level of success when they've 
they haven't even thrown an NFL pass yet. They haven't even thrown a preseason pass yet. Um, so I, when we're talking about draft stuff, I, I really prioritize um, youth and, and more importantly, like uh, there's the concept of like breakout age for wide receivers. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, how you like, how you evaluate what players are doing production wise and skill set wise at the age they are compared to other ages, right? If you're seeing a guy who's 21 and a guy who's 23 and they're both the same, well, the 21 year old, like that guy at 23 probably wasn't doing it when he was 21, right? There's so much growth that the, those ages. Um, so I, I'm not sure like if I'm answering the question or not, but to me, age is so important. And this is another one of these things where John Schneider kind of seems to have maybe no opinion on age or maybe even prefer older prospects. Okay, now I have a side note on that question because I want to talk <laughs> about the CFL player that is coming in. Mm. Is it is it Stigen, 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 Stigen? Stiggers, I think. Yeah, I can't. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. I don't have that written down. But it, so look, this is this is a different situation when it comes to age versus experience, right? So this kid, he started in what was it, the fan led league where you could like type in the plays and I think Marshawn had something to do with that. And then he went to the <laughs> CFL. Crazy. And now he's coming to the NFL and he's had some good numbers to me. You're looking, he's a late round guy, right? He's going to be a day three guy, but you look at a kid who's maybe younger, but he actually has professional football experience. Would that change your opinion? Yeah. I mean, he's 22. So like, that's a touch. No, I know. I was thinking you said 21. So yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, you can uh, like, how old is JSN? JSN's like crazy young. Right. Um, and I think he was maybe 20 when they drafted him. So 22 is like a touch on the older side. It's not a big deal. But yeah, to your point, like, uh, I, I mean, I don't know how to really evaluate. Like, yes, it's professional experience, but how does college football compare to the CFL? I don't really know. But uh, that age, at least, is no reason to be concerned to me. Yeah. Okay. Just I thought that was it because I'm I'm intrigued by this kid coming in a little bit. I'd like to see how hopefully he'll play well. So, all right. Um. <laughs> this is this is going to be a Brian and Jeff question again. So this is from Anders. Would you rather? Are you ready? A stick and pick at 16, three picks in the top 102. B trade back with Green Bay for pick 25 and 58, four picks in top 102. Or C trade back with Washington for pick 36, 40 and 67, five picks in the top 102. Um, comparable to trading back twice, they say. Which would you prefer? Jeff, I want you to go first. I like B the best. Okay. Um, And weirdly enough, I like A better than C. I think the problem with this roster, I know C is probably the more logical and really the more dice rolls, the more shots you take, but I like B. I think it's the good sweet spot between maintaining a first-round pick because these guys need quality. I know that you're more likely to hit the more picks you have, but you look at this roster, you look at the players they sent out to speak today. Those are like the voices of the franchise. And <laughs> sorry, I shouldn't laugh. And it's pretty, like, it's D- pretty rough. <laughs> DK didn't speak and Witherspoon didn't speak. Those are probably the two best players, but how many teams would have their opening day and not have like an all pro caliber player speak. And it's, I just saw a mock draft today when I was actually getting ready for a show. It was on the ringer and they traded with Kansas city and it was 32 and 64. Mm-hmm. I struggle with that one because if 64 doesn't hit, you're giving up and see, I was in a unique spot because of all the quarterbacks receivers and O-line they're getting probably a top five to seven player on their board. If they stay at 16. So I like B, I think it's the best of all the scenarios. Cause you got the good, you can still get a good guy in your first round, but I like, I, I struggle. I, I might even take a, if you, really put me under the mark, but I think B would be my answer. Brian, what about you? I have to tell you a quick story. Uh, so Rachel, my amazing wife for a long time, uh, would go to get her oil changed and, and <laughs> they would give her the, the different package options of getting your oil changed. And there's like a, B and C and she'd, she'd come back. She's like, I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, let me guess. Did you pick the middle one? Yeah, I just picked medium. 
<laughs> and I used to harass her to no end that she would always just pick medium of anything because she didn't want to go to the extreme of any of it. And I think that's kind of what Jeff's talking about here. I, like there is a discomfort with giving up the 16th pick to have what is more draft capital in the C scenario here of, you know, you're going to get five shots within probably the best part of this draft, which is like, Second round, I would say, is the sweet spot of this draft. I also think 16 is a sweet spot. Like like 12 to 20, you're going to get a shot at a blue chip player, like a true first round level player. And so to give that up, you got to be real sure. And so I, I do personally, I like the B option after all that. I agree because, because of who I think would still be available at, at 25. And that I think 55 is high enough that you're going to get another starter and another person of high quality at that. I would rather that scenario than if you're trading out of the first round entirely, you are out. Like Graham Barton is not an option. Certainly Fatanu is not an option. Um, Jared Burse, Byron Murphy, like, uh, you know, on and on are not going to be options all the way out of the first round. So I'm with Jeff. I think B would be my first choice. Um, and I probably would go A with my second choice as well. So I guess Jeff and I are, are drinking from the same trough. So it's interesting. So um, Kristen asked a question of me and she said, Dana, in the unlikely event that they move up to get someone, who do you think it will be? And here's the interesting thing about this question to me is I, I kind of laughed when I read it the first time because I was like, that's not going to happen because they don't do that, right? That's just so against the grain of everything that we have been, you know, uh, you know, learned about this front office. I really don't think that they would move up just because they don't have anything in the second round to give up. to that. So I don't know who would trade unless it was a player or something along those lines. But I think in my opinion, if they were going to move up, it would have to be not necessarily positional. It would have to be a player. They want that guy come hell or high water, whether that be alt or whether that be, you know, one of the, like, they're not going after a quarterback. They're not going after a wide receiver. And if they do, it will shock the crap out of me. Right. Um, that will just, I can't even wrap my brain around that. So, um, so, and really that's, if you're going to move up those, that's kind of the top, right? That's who you're running around those wide receivers. And the, so then it would have to be, they know for sure that let's say Murphy, who you like, is going to X team and they want them no matter what. I just don't think that that, that is a possibility. So then I give that question back to you guys. And Nathan, I'll start with you. Do you can you even enter that in your brain? Is that something that you would even think that they would consider? And I think it'd have to be for a quarterback. Like it's the only logical, right? If they had that, yeah. There, there's like I, I like I mean or you know they're gonna they can evaluate people differently like maybe they do just absolutely love verse or Murphy or you know mm. who or Brock Bowers or whoever, um, but to me those guys are all kind of in a similar tier and so trading up to get Murphy when you could have sat at sixteen and picked verse is kind of like right. that's tough right so if you're going up it seems like you have to be going up for a quarterback. Mm -hmm. Jeff, Brian, do you, do you even, I, it doesn't make sense to me. So from what I've been told and, and the people I've talked to really this draft, you have the first round and you have these blue chip players, everything else is kind of, Emery called them the lunch pail players. These are the, the, not the blue chip guys. These are the guys that round out your team. And so to my, me in my head, that means that for the most part, there are certain players that are interchangeable. So like Nathan said, you know, you don't have to go get this one because he's the only one. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know. I just thought that was really interesting. Uh, I, Jeffrey, oh, Brian, go I, ahead. Sorry, no, no, I'll just say you. quickly. I do think that the, in this draft, there are some wide receivers that will go in round two that can become blue chip players. I think yeah, there's wide okay. receiver, like really high quality receivers. I mean, you're talking about, you know, A.D. Mitchell, Xavier Worthy, Leggett, like uh, I like Ricky Pearsall. Like there's a lot of these guys that are going to go in the second round that I think have blue chip upside. Um, but what I think and this happens every year. John Schneider does not trade up in the first round. And so everyone's like, John Schneider does only trades back. What people forget is John Schneider trades up consistently after the, the mid rounds. Round. Yeah. 
he has traded up into the second round for DK Metcalf. He traded up in third round for Tyler at Lockett. He's traded up uh, for, uh, um, who was the guy? Daryl Taylor. Daryl oh. Taylor, he traded up for Jimmy Williams. No, who's who who's the name of that yeah. guy? Oh, uh, Jimmy Williams or something like that, right? Something Williams. Some, yeah, it's Jay the Williams. Bama oh. guy who had no Bama, names. Yeah, they so they, they he trades That's up bad. in later rounds, um, all the time, and so it's not an uh, either or. But he does not trade up in the first round. And generally speaking, mm-hmm. I hundred percent agree with Nathan. Only thing they trade up for is if maybe like Drake May is taking a fall and they're in love with Drake May and they're like, well, we're not going to like spoil like waste this. But even if they wanted to do that, I just don't see the ammunition for it. Like right. they'd have to trade, they'd have to trade potentially a first next year. That's not they'd have to, yeah. and the first this year, and that that's a scary it's thought. It's the only thing they could do. Mm-hmm. This this roster is not ready for the rookie contract window where like drop in the rookie and you're good to go. Because by the way, if you're drafting that rookie quarterback in the first round, you're not drafting the offensive line. I mean, you're not drafting Byron Murphy. You're not drafting Jared verse. So now you have to get them or someone equivalent of them next year, but now you don't have a first round pick. Like there's just a lot of flaws with that roster building approach. I wish it was the right time for it, but it's not. Agreed. Jesse Williams. Jesse Williams. Thank you. Thank you. We said every name with Jay. <laughs> every Jay name. No. <laughs> I knew Jay and Williams. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That is all for Patreon questions. There weren't very many this week. Love um, it. Well, it's go ahead, Jeff. It's weirdly quiet around the draft right now. Like there's like a weird consensus about the top 10, like not the prospects. Like there's not a lot of like last year, there was a lot of like battling about some, who some of these guys are like everyone just acknowledges like Roma Dunze is really good. And Malik Davis is really good. And it's like weirdly quiet. And it's like, it's, it's kind of an uneasy feeling. Two we- We're two weeks out. It's funny you say that because I was watching Mel, is it Mel? Yeah, Mel Kipper and Field Yates. And they were having, you know, their little podcast they were doing. And they literally spent a chunk of it talking about Harrison, Odunze, and Nate. And, and who, which one of the three is going to go first? And which, and oh, it depends on the team and the scheme. And what if this happened? And I'm like, they're all going top nine. Like. I know. I'm like, <laughs> what, why are we debating one position? It was so funny. So I agree with you. It seems like they're talking about the top 20 players and that's it. Like that's all they're invested in. It's very odd. I think we're about to get into more, more of a noisy season. Like the teams are probably doing the real work now and kind of finalizing stuff. And the next, as we get closer to the draft is when we're going to get the Pauline reports about how Seattle really loves some cornerback <laughs> or whatever. And, you know, that that's going to be the, then teams are going to be like, okay, we got to throw everyone else off the scent here. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's also, it's also a little bit boring. Most all the mock drafts have Troy Fatano going to the Seahawks. I'd be excited about that, but it, it you know, I I'd enjoy a little bit of variety to it. Uh, before we, we go on, I want to thank Dana, Dana O'Gorman for hosting, uh, the patron questions. Appreciate that. And for joining, she's got, uh, some plans she's got to get to. So thank you. And we will talk again soon. Boys, do you have a few more minutes? Can we talk a little bit longer? Yeah. Yeah. Right. I got lots of time. All right. Well, so we'll do some mock draft stuff cause we're, you know, crazy like that. It's two weeks away. I know we got to do it. I do want to ask, we've talked about Edge, but I don't know if we've talked about it enough. And the reason I'm bringing it up is if you look at the roster, you look at they spent two a second round pick in back to back years on Boye Mafe, on Derek Hall. They've got Uchenna Nuosu, who's going to be back healthy. Um, They've still got Daryl Taylor. Like They've got a number. Hey, they've got Levi Bell. Don't forget about Levi Bell. I'm a big fan. But they have had um, two of their top, uh, keep saying top, two of their 30 visits have been Jared Verse and Chop Robinson. That's not insignificant. And if you look at, and also they had Grayson Murphy, who's, he's more of a defense, like a defensive end in a 3 4 than more than a true edge player, I think. Um, but they, They've met with a number of edge players. There's another guy I was trying to look at. I saw them meet with. Oh, they met with Dallas Turner. They met with Braylon Trice. Those are also edge players. Um, 
Oh, and they also met with uh, Marshawn Neeland, who's a kind of a sleeper Western Michigan uh, edge guy that a lot of folks like. Are they going to draft an edge in the first round? Like that's, if you look at John Schneider's tendencies, it is a million times more likely that John Schneider will draft an edge rusher than that he will draft a defensive tackle or an interior offensive lineman. I think they could, and I don't know, like, I don't think it's a bad thing. Would you, you're, you're kind of out. I, I'm, I'm actually having a, a tough time pegging where you are on this because you love verse, right? I love verse. But I feel like you're not big on the idea of drafting an edge. I think so. I don't think that any of the players that they have profile to be top end edge rushers. So I am I am I am for finding a if you have someone that you think can be a double team commanding edge rusher, super valuable. We'll never question it. Do it. Like I wouldn't care about pushing most of those guys off the roster. Like I like them. I'm happy to have them on the team, but none of them are like a Nick Bosa level, you know, guys. I happen to be un like chop Robinson gives me a lot of agita. Um, really? He does because he is a total toolsy guy without production that I can see Schneider falling in love with. And then him coming in and just being, raw and not really being elite and so i'm uncomfortable with chop robinson jared verse to me i told jeff i'm gonna say it out loud this will this will now be on video for people to make fun of me it finally hit me who the comp for me is on jared verse and this is gonna sound ridiculous but i'm gonna say it anyway the comp for me is terrell suggs it is like power rusher not the bendiest dude but he will eat you for lunch like he will just destroy offensive linemen and so that's a guy that to me has the potential to be blue chipper i would hate here's that my, here's my argument for chop robinson and we talked about right. this earlier with age what what did jared verse do in his age 21 year in college oh good question i won't look it up not a damn thing. Yeah. Four tackles. Four tackles. Chop Robinson just played a full year on a on a pretty good Penn State team. So this is like, you know, going back to that question of like, hey, what like how much does age matter for uh prospects and stuff? It's not an apples to apples to say, hey, we want to, you know, you want to knock chop for his production and he's got two years until he's old as as versus. So but I do get it. I do yeah. get the you are, you know, speculating a lot more just because he, you know, it doesn't mean that Chop's going to grow into where Verse is today either. So it's like it's, you know, a gamble. Rasheem Green was super young and toolsy. Yeah. <laughs> How did that go? You yeah. know, he was never a first round prospect, though. I mean, he was a second round pick, it. though. Like, he third, was, no, he was a third round. Was he third round pick? Yeah. Okay. Chop has. I early, a, yeah. yeah, I think it was early third, but Chop has a uniquely like superpower that Mike Duger, his first step is mm -hmm. like unbelievable. But again, with the draft, so much of it is projecting. And what Nathan said is so true. Like uh, so much of it gets focused on what they did in college, but the whole point of the draft is projecting what they're going to do next. And that's what makes someone like chop tantalizing because there's not a lot of like evidence And Penn state's had a lot of guys that like haven't produced and they've come to the league and like their tools are so good. And they have like combine freaks year after year. So, He's like a total gamble. Like you're just betting on traits, you're betting on development. And that's scary. Like Jared Verse, you he came out, he ate the transfer. He was at a small school. He transferred to Florida State. And he really took off last the season before this year. This year he wasn't as dominant as last year, but you're hoping that age that trajectory just keeps going up, or you got to worry about him. Is he maxed out? So that's where it's such a tough projection on the edge rushers, but I know like Mina Kimes is her, sh her draft show. And what she does is she puts out each pick. She'll put out two names and she has different people on. And for each draft pick, she'll say, this and this. And every single time for the Seahawks, she puts Latu out there. And I, I cringe. I, maybe I'm wrong about him. I can't get behind that one. And she's like, Oh, edge is a huge need. I see O-line D tackle as the obvious needs here. So I, I'm, I'm cringing every time I can't, 
but I, I think Schneider will see this differently than I will. How about you, Nathan? Yeah, I I have never felt good about taking an offensive line in the first round in all of the mocks I've done. So I'm the exact opposite of you there, Jeff. And and I was kind of the opposite of you guys on the draft scenarios too. Like I think uh my preference would be C A B. Um, that's not surprising. <laughs> I, yeah. I, 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 I could have easy, more easily picked for you than I was picking for myself. I was like, Nathan would want this. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, because I, well, and part of it is I do like the depth of the guard class here. Um, so, yeah, maybe, I don't remember what the picks were exactly, like a couple picks into the second round. Maybe uh, Graham Barton's out of there. But you still have, you know, a, several other really interesting guard prospects that, that would be there. Um, as well as guys like, you know, Robinson, not Chop, but um, the guy out of Missouri. Darius Robinson. Uh, yeah, yeah. Michael Hall, some of those types of guys, too. So, um, yeah, I, I'm not, like, I'm not sold on, like, Fountaineau or some of these, like, I, I got crap last time for not being big on him. The UW fans were out for me. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't feel any strong need to sit there at 16 and take any of the offensive linemen that are likely to be there. I think, better oh, yeah. go ahead. I'd go say ahead. Nathan would be a much better executive than I would because your statement is f- full of no emotion. It's just logical. I'm emotional. I've been burned by a 2017 <laughs> draft and it's still deep inside my soul for the Seahawks. And I'm basically overcorrecting that. But I I a lot of it's for me is based on emotion. What you're saying is a lot of how the analytical like that is the most logical way of approaching the draft. But I I wouldn't have drafted DK though, so you know. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, oh. I had production concerns with him. Yeah, and just uh, I didn't appreciate how that he could be that physically dominating even in the NFL. That was what that surprised me. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the guy who you really like, Jazz Ferguson. You were a big Jazz. No, Ferguson. that wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> never bring up DK. I, I can't help it. Uh, I, I will say that I am much higher on the second round D tackles than I am on the second round and later guards. I think Michael Hall Jr., Tavondre Sweat, um, even guys like Chris Jenkins, not as much. Like Chris Jenkins actually is an interesting one. He to me is like Cooper Beebe. Like they're roughly equivalent. High floor kind of lower ceiling guys i don't see them as being like dominant where michael hall jr perfect example of the kind of thing you're talking about nathan 20 years old flashed some really interesting film and can develop and, and i i think i see super high and, and like it, he's like chop robinson in that regard but he's going to be available in the second round mm-hmm Chop Robinson at 16 makes me very uncomfortable. If Chop Robinson we're talking about at 54, I'm like, sweet. Like, that sounds interesting. Um, And Sweat, even with the legal stuff, we'll figure out what's going on there. But I've said a million times, huge fan of his. I don't have a guard that I think is going to go in the second round or later that fits that type of profile. So that's where this notion of trade back, trade back, acquire more picks, acquire more picks. I hear what you're saying, Jeff. 2017 is a good example where the Seahawks, I feel like, got too cute. And they they traded back multiple times out of the first round, acquiring picks, which they did absolute dick with. I mean, you're talking like Lano Hill and Tedrick Thompson, kind of like Amaro Darbo's. Like, you're getting guys that were non-good. And it doesn't matter. Like, any bad player is a bad player. But more picks does not mean that you draft well. And if you look at where the most Pro Bowls, Hall of Fame, All Pros, and there's lots of reasons for this. They're first rounders. Like it, it drops off precipitously as you go through the draft. So I do think there is a balance. It isn't just as like I see a lot of folks on Twitter doing these mock drafts. Where like I traded back 75 times. I got 35 picks. There's also a limit to how many rookies you can carry. So like I, that's where I, I think there's got to be a little bit more uh, of a balance. And that's where I struggle with that KC example. I saw the ringer did that trade where say you get a guy at 16 that hits and to get that player in two years, you'd have to trade like two first round picks to get him. and 32 and 64. Like that could be like, I'm trying to think like Jaron Reed and 
Ethan Posick. Ethan Posick, yeah. <laughs> and it's like you're giving up like an all pro player for Ethan Posick and Jaron Reed. Like, ah, I'm struggling. Well, yeah, and that's the other thing too. Like, it's very easy to sit here today and say, "I would trade back, and I would, you know, target these dark horse draft pe- uh, prospects that only I'm smart enough to know are actually good." But then draft day comes along, and we're sitting there at 16, and it's like Jared Verse and Chop Robinson and Byron Murphy, and I'm gonna lose my mind. <laughs> I'm gonna die a little inside when they trade back, even though I like I know it's the right thing to do because yeah, it hurts. But but that's again like I would I'm kind of with you guys maybe a little bit opposite, but like I would either want to go farther back and get the extra pick, but staying there at 16 is also really tempting because, so it's just a question to me of like, what do you find at 25 versus 32 or whatever? I mean, I think there's a decent chance that one of, if we're just talking edge for a second, one of Latu, Dallas Turner, Jared verse, and certainly chop Robinson would be available at 16. So you're looking at a situation. Most like I saw, uh, Sam Monson and PFF today was like, are people sleeping on Jared Verse as being like, should he be edge one in this class? Um, anyway, I think that you could potentially get the top edge rusher in this draft class. This is super unique this year. And you're going to be passing on that. Because that's hard to do. And then you, you toss in a Byron Murphy. If he's there... And some of the, if Murphy and Verse are both there and you pass on both of those guys, as much of a Graham Barton fan as I am, that would be a tough, tough sell. You better be right. Yeah. Um, all right. Do we want to do do a mock? You guys up for a mock? Yeah. I think we have to now. We have to. <laughs> we have to. All right. Which which one do we want? We want to do our, our pro football network kind of thing uh give me a second to see if i can delete all the ads um all right while fill time for me while i'm doing this um do you either of you guys have a favorite prospect that you, you're like you're starting to like like more than other people could be an early round could be a late round just somebody that you're kind of becoming a little bit more enamored with hmm. mm, i th- one guy, I mean, just in terms of like who do I like more than I think most people most yeah people might like Tyler Guyton, the tackle out of Oklahoma. Um, I like him quite a bit. Uh, but I don't know, he's typically like a end of the first early second guy, so I don't know if like he's not flying under the radar or anything. Um no, I don't think I have like a guy. I don't know, Jeff. Do you have anyone that just doesn't get a lot of love? Um, one guy I've been wondering about. I won't say I like him specifically. We've like barely talked about JC Latham. Like we mm. have not almost talked about him this whole process. And he's probably more of a right tackle, but he's like a dominant run blocker potentially. And like big, like he looks like a refrigerator. And like, I wonder like, are we just forgetting about him? Like, is he out of the range? So I'm like kind of trying to dive back. And the more I kind of dive into those tackles, like Fuaga, Fuanga, like he's becoming like my dream pick, but I just don't see how he's going to be there. But yeah, I, um, a name that we haven't talked about as much that as I was getting in on the guard stuff and I looked a little more into it that I think could be on the list is Jordan Morgan. He's hmm. a lot of people profile him as a tackle, but he, like As I looked at him, right? I think he's a guard, like potentially that could also be a swing tackle if you need to. And and I, as I was reading around, other people were starting to to talk about him that way as well. So I think he belongs on our interior line list, but I think he's a second round prospect, not a first round prospect. I do like Gabe Murphy a lot too. It's cool that they brought him on a uh, in on a. Wait, did they bring? In- Gabe Murphy Grayson or- Murphy, not Gabriel Murphy. Like oh, they right. are both on UCLA. It's very confusing. Um, I've made that mistake, but no, it's it's Grayson that they brought. Oh, in. well, they brought in the wrong one. Maybe they, <laughs> maybe it was a mistake. The wrong you- G Murphy. Oh man, I saw I saw Derek was uh, saying he would be very excited by Brock Bowers. Like that would be a tantalizing pick. See, that's the one that gives me a lot of heartburn. <laughs> I just. <laughs> I, I mean, and I get like I totally get why he's a top fifth, like top fifteen, top ten, whatever. Um, and he could be amazing. I just 
like first round tight ends, these like really athletic tight ends. I I don't have a really good feel for these guys like really working out. Uh and I also just maybe it's the holdover from the Pete era, but I just like and, and maybe some of the Jimmy Graham stuff. I just have some like scar tissue from like, oh, they're gonna bring this guy in and just ask him to block 40 times again. It's such it's such a different group. Although there are there are signs that they're gonna come in here and try to really force the run. Like it may be more like Mike McDonald talked about it. Ryan Grubb, uh, offensive line, Huff, offensive line. The there was time. If there's one criticism I had of Grubb last couple years, is there are moments where he just gets obsessed with running the ball regardless, and it's like a tough guy thing as opposed to sticking with what's working. I loved that he had balance, but there's times it was forced. So I'm a little worried that they're going to overcorrect in that regards because they're going to look at, oh, we've got K9 and we've got Zach Charbonnet. We're going to be a running team. I hope that they're just a balanced, smart offense and not like pushing one way or the other. So I just talked about JC Latham. I just saw a tweet from Matt Miller talking about the terrible hit rate of Alabama offensive tackles. And he's listed basically all of them last 10 years. Evan Neal, uh, James Carpenter, DJ Fluker, Alex Leatherwood, Jedrick Willis in the top 10. (laughs) That's not, not, not good. No, Saban is over coaching these guys. I I was I went through the different NFC West teams and their needs this morning, and I really wonder if the Rams are going to take a tackle at nineteen. We've been talking about quarterback and some other things, but I wonder like Amarius Mims is a guy to me that might make a lot of sense for them. Their offensive line is exactly what I like, almost exactly what I wish the Seahawks had. I mean, it's frustrating that offense, their offense is really, really well set up. Um, it's, it's set up for them to draft a young quarterback and succeed Matt Stafford and like not miss a beat. Um, where they got wide receivers, tight ends, offensive line, young running back. Um, so we'll see. So here we are. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and do our draft here. Um, we're at 16. And just like we talked about, here's Jared Verse. Here's Troy Fautanu, Byron Murphy, Chop Robinson. On down the line. Interesting. Michael Penix climbing up that list. He's now 29. Um, what do you guys do? Uh, Nathan, what is your what, what if you want to see trade offers? Should we look at trade offers before we decide? Or is there is there a guy that you just say we're picking regardless? Ooh. What if, what if uh what if, what have we been intending to do? Uh, I feel like we trade a lot. Do, have we done many where the the team just sits at sixteen and we see what that ends up looking? We've like? done a mix, you okay. know. We've done okay. a mix. Uh, yeah. Let's look at some trade offers then. Why not? Um, I just refuse to trade with the 49ers. but they always want to. That's a good. That'd be a great deal. Uh, that's a. That's a pretty appealing deal, although you're giving up 81. Yeah, giving up 81. Getting a, a second round pick next year would be certainly worth it. In real life, I think you do that every in time. In real life, yeah. Yeah. This doesn't not doesn't feel great. But okay. also I don't think in real life you ever get that offer. <laughs> oh hell no. <laughs> well, I mean, this thing is is if you if if you love one of these guys. Yeah, maybe. they need a left tackle. I want to take verse. I mean, we've talked about him so much now. Um, what, so verse, we got to vote for verse. Jeff, where are you? I would want to trade down, but not too far, because I would want one of verse Fautanu or Murphy here. But man, that's rolling the dice. Um, I'd be totally cool taking verse. Let's take Jared verse. We have not done that very often. Let's see how the draft plays out when we go edge with the first pick and we don't trade back. Okay, so this is kind of the the harshest way to take an edge and we're, we're in alignment. We're going to take verse as that edge. Okay. So now we watch, we watch all of these <laughs> players just Ugh. fall off Ugh, the board. Leonard Williams. Why? Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I mean, I got to rewind a little bit and look at what happened. So, um, chop goes to <laughs> LA 
is like the two two Atwell D Eskridge, you know, a few <laughs> years back. Um, Fautanu goes to the Steelers. Penix goes to Minnesota at twenty three. Uh, there's Mims there. Johnny Newton, Cooper DeJean, uh, Murphy. So late. Graham Barton late. Um, Christian Haynes sneaking into the first round. Um, JPJ. Yeah. Uh, like this is the Darius Robinson, Jordan Morgan kind of area. Um, there's Cooper BB. There's Sweats. Edge Cooper. So like you're just seeing Cedric Gray. That is high. I don't know that he is a second round prospect, but Chris Mahogany, that is very high. Junior Colson's gone. Malachi Corley has been a hot prospect. He's been definitely moving up. I don't know, second round, but I have seen him projected there a few different places. There's the Marshawn Nealon guy that the Seahawks have had a visit with. Um, Ruka Roro's gone. McMillan, Michael Hall Jr., pretty close. Brandon Dorless. I mean, guys, this would be rough. That's what I'm saying. That's option C. Like, it's it's hard like i mean it's one of those where you know you pass on verse it hurts and then you but you take verse and then you watch these guys come off the board and it's like oh my gosh well option B, I, byron murphy would be sitting there exactly i think i think jeff it's clear that nathan's gonna want cole bishop as <laughs> the next pick <laughs> all right tell me give you guys give me your cole bishop takes because uh I went back and watched him some more, and my my hot take has cooled a little. But yeah, okay. I'm curious what you guys think. Jeff, you have a you want to go first? He's just very okay. Uh, he, he doesn't excite me, and he like he's kind of like I don't want to say the Cody Barton of safeties but as a prospect, but Utah. I I just find a lot of the other safeties excite me a lot more. He's just kind of solid at everything. Maybe I'm missing something there, but. When I saw that picture that I sent Brian the other day of Cole Bishop, enchilada Wednesday. Okay, <laughs> this is this is uh, courageous of me doing this, showing my screen while I do this. But um, uh, Cole Bishop, I just want to know where he ranked overall for safeties. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> Is that Athletic. the latest? No, this this is the latest. This is the latest. Um, April sixth. So, um, fourteenth out of one thousand eighty-two safeties uh, since nineteen eighty-seven in his RAS score, ninety-eighth, not almost ninety-ninth percentile. Uh, his speed grades. He did not do agility testing, and so this is the thing that's the knock: is he is not a free safety. But the Seahawks are actually looking a lot at split safety prospects. And they're also looking at guys that are hybrids. And I have seen people talk about Cole Bishop being able to play nickel backer, like actually be a nickel linebacker, actually be a, like a nickel corner or like a slot player, as well as a um, safety. So he's got, I don't think he's necessarily like your starter but he seems like potentially a valuable part of a defense that, that someone like Mike McDonald could get the most out of um, as an athlete and, and in the secondary. He's got some baby arms though, huh? And maybe <laughs> that does. actually, so this is my problem with Cole Bishop because I actually think he should be a free safety. Um, when I, I only have the dumbest way to, to explain why that, what I don't like about Cole Bishop and it's, he's not soft. He's not afraid to stick his his nose into a pile or make a tackle. Like he comes down, he plays hard. But if he was a, for his Madden Madden ratings, his hit power should be like zero. The dude, like he just comes up and he just like hugs guys. And I'm just waiting. I'm like, can you get the guy on the ground, please? And so, like his combine, like his Lance Zierlein's little write up on him, like he's an enforcer and he's an in the box safety. And I've heard that same stuff about like a nickel uh, linebacker. And I'm just like, the guy can't hit, hmm. not for lack of trying or anything. Um, and I just wonder how that's going to end up translating in the NFL where, you know, he's got to get Derrick Henry on the ground or whatever. And yeah, so that's my, like, I watched him and I just, my stomach just turns and I'm like, 
he does all of the right stuff and then it's just like the limpest tackles that i've ever seen i think that's a that's a that's a harsh criticism and it's it's good to hear because i i think that that's um uh not something you want to see uh and this is one of the things they bring up here below average length does at times impact his ability to wrap up on tackles well when you got like um t-rex arms you know yeah. what do you expect um so let's talk about some of the options here because i think this actually plays out interestingly peyton wilson high ceiling high bust potential just from an injury perspective we talked about bishop javon bullard i am growing he is growing and growing on me as a safety prospect he he brings the wood like he hits he makes plays he jumps routes like He's a little bit small, though. I mean, he's 5'10", 200. So he's not the biggest dude. But I like Javon Bullard. I just don't know if I want to build from the back um, in this way, like with small guys. Trevin Wallace, a guy that's got a visit that's also been climbing linebacker. He's more of an edge. I think he's an outside linebacker. Is that right? Am I right? No. Or is he a Mike? Anybody? I think he's a Mike. He might be right. He might be. He's, he's an off ball linebacker, right? I mean, yeah. I think I saw something about his pass rush, and so I think I, I was thinking about him as an edge. Mason Smith is a high upside defensive tackle. If this is where you're stuck with defensive tackle, he's probably your best option at this point to get someone that could turn into starter quality. Is he the like the twenty year old like athletic but doesn't know how to play football? Yes. Yeah. He, yeah. yeah, he was a he was like a five star, and then he was injured, and then kind of came on pretty strong the last five six games of the last year for LSU. LSU had like the poor man's version of uh, Byron Murphy and uh, Sweat, right? Where like this guy was kind of their Murphy, and then they have a big dude too, don't didn't they? Who's the other defensive tackle? Adam? I don't it's, know. It, yeah, all right. Um, Dominic Pooney is farther down here, so if you get into guards you know your next picks 102 you might be able to get him there i think saying is there's no way he's 99 on the prospect list i think this guy is like a second round pick but he to me the, the jeff this guy is this year's um brian branch for me um i think he's that kind of player and then we got the quarterback right spencer rattler Jaden hicks is a guy that safety a lot of folks like what are so these names is, jumping out for you, Jeff? Um, I want to look. Can you pull up the list of guards? Yes. <laughs> the exact four names we got asked about before. Yes. Kenny Coleman, McCormick, and Zinter. I think this is way too high for Coleman. I think he's going to be a six rounder. I really do. He's a great athlete, but I, I don't think his. I don't think it holds up to this. No, I don't think the value. I don't think I ideally would like to take an offensive lineman here, but this is the thing. If you don't take one in the first round or move down, it almost makes sense to wait till the fourth. The Georgia center is there, right? Yeah. The Georgia center is there. You have the cook center. Oh, yep. Yeah. He would be pretty, pretty tempting. Really going to draft another center? I I would consider it. I don't know if they would. Walk me through that. What 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 then happens? Like uh, like walk. Uh, trust me, you know how much I want them to draft centers and have a good center. So like, but looking at this team, I can't wrap my head around the the ripple effect of that. Well, what happens is, yeah, it's unrealistic for sure. If I was running the team, I don't view Harris as much of anything but a depth. He can move over to guard. And then Olua Timmy, who was a fifth round pick, who probably projects more as a backup, just becomes the long term Mm -hmm. backup as a rookie. And that probably makes you better depth wise. It makes you better upside wise. But I can't see any scenario (laughs) that that Schneider does. So that. that Are you saying like I'm forgetting Schneider? I'm just want trying to know your thought process. So what you're thinking there is upgrade the center spot. You think he's the best of the offensive linemen to take at this point. So like take the best available, 
And then you take a guard maybe later still. I'd probably take a guard with the next pick. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Where would you guys vote? This is the this is the hard part of the draft where all these names start to look tempting and no one but no one looks good enough to be like, ah, oh, that's the one. That's exactly it. Um who do you like Bullard, right? I'm Brent? really tempted by Bullard. I might talk myself into Mason Smith and then regret it. Um, because he's just like a toolsy guy that never really realizes his potential. I'd roll who's the dice with Payne Wilson. Who's the other safety? Mm. What's that? Who who are the other safeties that are available? Because like I don't think Oh, okay. We there's some decent safeties that could be available. Like you could get Jaden Hicks at least in like this Mustafa. thing. The next pick. Yeah, Mustafa's. I like Mustafa more than Bullard. I think. Mm. I think I... Interesting. Like Peyton Wilson. I think that's not a uh, like we haven't done that very much. He arguably has the highest upside of anybody on this list. Um, oh, wow. has... it's close. Yeah. So we want to do that and see how this feels. How old is he? But yeah, let's yeah. let's let's do it. Uh, no, let's see how old he is. How old is he? Someone look it up for me. Twenty three, and he looks forty. Oof. <laughs> okay, we're locking. We're, we're him having in. we're having the all yeah. old draft here. We're locking him in. Peyton Wilson. We'll see how this feels. I I think I probably oh, would have gone Bullard. <laughs> oh, look at that. But Cole Bishop and Mason Smith's in right there. Delmar Glaze is actually a guy that Dane Brugler has pretty high on his guard list. Um, I, I want to look more at McKinley Jackson goes. Roger Rosengarten, they're staying still. Gone. Oh, San Francisco. Oh. Damn you. They have two thirds screen base. Kevin Wallace also. gone. Yeah, Javon Boyle goes immediately after. Um, okay, so here we are. So it's hard you got to not. these two guys. Zinter, the- once you get into this area, it's really hard not to take Zinter for me. Sure. I mean, in this, it's it's a it's a flaw of this simulator that they've got him pegged so late, we can still get him later. Mm-hmm. Um, Dylan McMahon's another guy that is more of a center, but it's I think... Center. He's he's just kind of an athlete. I'm not sure that he's a guy you take this early. Um, I think I would let's just take a quick. Well, Spencer Rattler. Rattlers. <laughs> Meke Wingo is another name. That's the LSU defensive tackle, and he's huge, right? He's like three thirty yeah. or something. No, no, not. he's oh, he's the maybe he's the one I was thinking of. Yeah, I think he's Murphy and uh, Mason Smith is. Yeah. Oh, what, what like the heck? Three oh eight though, actually. Brian wants the Yale offensive tackle. <laughs> yeah, why not, man? He's a big dude. Uh, I'm just looking down this list. You got Theo Johnson. Um. I think I would take Mason Smith here. Where would you guys go? A lot of defense. Yeah. Tell me, tell me where you'd go differently. Here's the offensive names. Are like, do you feel good about calling one of these names at 102? No, knowing that you got to pick at 118. I take Rattler or Center. Interesting. Nathan. Um I I I think it probably is one of those first two names. One of these two. Um I really like Austin Booker actually too, but if you're taking verse yeah. 16, then not as appealing. Um let's do Mason Smith if you feel Let's let's give that a let's give that a, a go and and see where this feels as we go through. I this is very different. We've been getting absolutely 
blown out of the water every time we pass on a guy and they're just gone right next. So Cole Bishop's still on the board. Cole Bishop's still there. Um, we did not take a safety. We don't have a guard yet. We, we do don't have an not, offensive lineman. Yeah, we got it. We got to take a guard here. Like we just got to. Um, McCormick's Zinter. pretty tempting. Would you take Zinter or McCormick if this was a situation for you two? Zinter. Yeah. Okay, but in re if we're if this is reality and he's here in the fourth round, what does that say about his recovery? Maybe at the fourth round it doesn't say a lot, but I don't uh, think it does. I I really think from what I've been gathering with Zinter is he's just a lot of folks just think he's got limited athletic ability, and so he is a solid but not. It's it's a little bit like Ola with Timmy, a better version oh, yeah. of Ola with Timmy. Is he like a Jonah Jackson type of prospect? Like, I think he's not quite that. Jonah Jackson was a big body dude. I don't think Zinter's that. So big. let's maybe we take McCormick. Let's change it up. Zinter okay. is only yeah. We can change it up. Zinter's only twenty two. Yeah, I I I personally would take Zinter here, but I, I I could I would not be upset with McCormick either. Like I think it's kind of a roll of the dice. So we're going McCormick. Still sure. passing Cole Bishop. <laughs> Still passing on Cole Bishop. That is true. Okay. Now we're all the way down to 179. We do have There's a guard. Ugly gaps in this draft. There are this is this is what the stick and pick draft. We're doing a stick and pick draft. Um Kenny Loggins. <laughs> There's Nathan's boy at tight end. Kenny Loggins. Yeah, Aaron. And- Kenny Loggins, who also is on the <laughs> Show You the Way song with Michael McDonald and Thundercat. Oh, no. So we got to get the band together. Oh, no. Oh, I would go. Oh, we already drafted the linebacker. I do like Maris Lufau um, as a late round flyer. Tip Ryman. Ooh. Ooh. Eric All's still there, though. So, can't. yeah. Screw Eric All, man. I, I, <laughs> Tip Ryman's there. You know, I, I'll fight you on that one. Um, who who are the receivers that are out there? I Washington I saw. Ugh. Ugh. Yeah, it's yeah. kind of gotten gross. I I like Anthony Gould, but I'm kind of alone. We he's, the he's, he's, yeah, this, yeah, this wide receiver class is really good, but like, yeah, it drives up, and then it gets really bad. Uh, yeah. Is the Utah offensive lineman? I know he's a favorite. Yeah, him. I like. Yeah. Yeah, he's an interesting. I think that's an interesting additional guy to think about for sure. Um, With one ninety two too, he he makes a. You can probably get him the next pick. Yeah, we, we, yeah, we were at one seventy. Yeah, why don't we why don't we wait on him? And play the game I say, here. I think one of the tight ends. I want I want to watch you two fight each other. So, oh, I I get to press the button. There's no fight. <laughs> we're taking Tip Ryman. Ah. It's I done. guess that, that wasn't as exciting as I was hoping. All right, call <laughs> oh, so like, oh no, he's gone. And this is oh, where wait. I get Yeah. Who had Eric All but did what's his name go? The um who was the other guy we were looking at there? Oh, oh Lemay's still uh, there. Uh, okay, I didn't oh, get yeah. fired. I was about to fire myself. <laughs> Any of these guys Brendan Jackson, we already got an edge. Um Lemay is uh, I think a, a decent pick. I do like Gabe Murphy, though. Gabe Murphy, where did I miss him? Uh, he's he's on he's an edge. I don't know if he's he oh. should still be in there, but he might be down a bit. Okay. Hampton, There's Dominic Hampton. Hampton. See, this is where we Rob's head will pop out of his socket. But I, Rob, if you're but Rob Staten, if you're listening, love you, dude. But really, did not like your mock that you put out today. It made me like physically uncomfortable to read uh, I that. Oh, not a fan. You're not, not a Darius a Robinson fan. guy. Not really. No, mm-hmm. not as your number one pick. And, and it just felt like a very low ceiling um, draft. I was not, I was not loving it, not feeling it. Um, There's Gabe Murphy all the way down here. I mean, they also have way down here. Like, there's Nathaniel Watson. If you go all the way down, yeah, Michael Barrett's like 500 and something here, like some crazy thing. Anyway, who are on the board here from who they've like had visits with? Um, is this where they would take 
like Stiggers or Michael Mc or Michael Dow. Uh, Gonclave, uh, Gonclaves is wrong, long gone, right? Yeah, he's gone. Um, Glover, Stiggers, she's three oh nine. Ugh, Toronto. It's so weird that he's going into the draft. Usually, when you play in a CFL, you're not drafted. Yeah, right. What um Tyrese Knight, I think, is usually still here. I don't like him though. He's yeah. gone. What other visits have they had? Tyrese Knight, uh John Reese Plumley, the quarterback from UCF. Ugh. Okay, he's still there. Uh Grayson Murphy. Nathaniel Grayson's Watson. Grayson's there. Watson is still there. Christian Boyd, the you and I guy, is here. I think at? he's gone. He's been going higher yeah, and higher. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Um, and then did you look at uh where'd he go? What Travis Glover? Was he gone? Nope. Okay. Uh, they've had a visit with this guy. <laughs> look at that yep. RAS. What was it? Like two? Four seven one. Oof. Nice. Uh, Michael Dowell, D O W E L L. Nope. Okay. Our board's been cleaned up. Dominic Hampton. We could double up at safety. Yeah, let's let's just let's make a call here. What do we want to do? I I would say Lomea is a great call if you're interested in him. I let's, think. Let's go uh, with the uh, Georgia State. Let's go with Glover. Uh, since they've had a visit with him, actually. Okay. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> 323 like under you... under objection from from uh, Jeff and I but uh, that's fine. This is an let's, odd draft. This is a fantastic draft. What are you talking about? AJ Barner is the top guy left. I mean, I like Dominic AJ Hampton. Barner. Let's get him in the 7th. We're fine. Done. We're taking we're taking him. All right. So let's see how <sighs> I don't know, guys. Got Jared Verse though. <laughs> we did. So so chat, give us give us your thoughts. I'd love to know where folks are on this. Um, give us your grades in chat. Ooh, somebody yeah. threw out Vaki. He's usually there in the seventh round. I, I definitely like him more than yeah. Him. He's an like he also has return returner ability in this new return game kind of thing. Uh like running back kind of returner. Nathan, how do you feel about this draft? Okay. Um, you know, you have to like verse. That's exciting. Wilson and Mason Smith are real gambles, right? Um, <clears throat> but I, I get what you're gambling on there. So I'm okay with that. Um, a D minus. Uh, I, I don't think it's bad at all but it really is hard to get excited about anything after 16 like i don't there's nothing in there like oh cool we got that guy there jeff i'm like a dead c on this one it's like obviously versus obviously the one we can raise the ceiling of this but to come out with only one offensive lineman and one guard as mason mccormick i'd be kind of puking <laughs> at the side, of, yeah. Um, yeah. Like I advocate for Peyton Wilson because he's got like first round talent, and eighty one is sort of a no brainer. But like I keep looking at it and I'm staring right at him, and like ugh, makes me uncomfortable. I was the one advocating for that pick. Yeah, it wasn't think, that long ago that that you were sending me videos of Peyton Wilson. Like, have you seen this guy? The guy is. A I monster. know, but then I read about his medicals and how much he gets injured. It's just. I want to come out of this draft. We said it last year, Brian, our favorite mock draft last year was that one. We just like absolutely loaded on the trenches where we took like Skaronsky and Darnell Washington and one of the other. And we were like, so happy with this. And then this draft, it's like, we barely touch it. And we're like, Peyton Wilson is like the athletic linebacker tight end is the athletic guy. We don't take a safety until the seventh round. Ugh. Here's what I will say about this draft guys. Here's what I will say. This looks very much like a John Schneider draft. It does. <laughs> this looks a lot like a John Schneider draft. I can absolutely see him making every one of these picks. 
And that's why we hate it. Like Jared Verse. And I'd be excited. I mean, I really, you know how much I like him. Peyton Wilson, linebacker, twitchy, toolsy linebacker, maybe a little bit on the older side. Absolutely. Like maybe some injury issues. Sure. Mason Smith screams John Schneider. Like a little bit later, D tackle. Mason McCormick, fourth round guard, toolsy. Like that's Anthony Bradford all over again, right? Just another guard. Travis Glover screams it. Um, Dominic Hampton, safety in the seventh. Like a lot of these things feel like a John Schneider draft. So we could be looking at the Seahawks draft right now. We nailed it 100%. This is probably our most accurate Schneider draft I think we've done. That's what I found myself thinking as I was looking at this is I don't feel good about this. I'm not like smiling. But this does feel Jared Verse, Peyton Wilson, Mason Smith, Mason McCormick, Tip Ryman, Travis Glover, Dominic Hampton. Mason. Yeah. Ooh. But, but you know, again, again, going back to the draft scenarios that we had in the Patreon questions, like this is what you sign up for when you stick at 16, right? Like, I don't thinking back, there's not anything like, oh, well, if we had swapped a guard with Peyton Wilson and then took this other dude where we took McCourt, like it would be so much better. I don't think there's anything like that, right? You were signing up for Jared verse needs to be a game breaker and you find ways to fill out the roster with the rest of the guys. And so it's really like this whole draft is about Jared verse and eating the 60 picks or 70 picks or whatever it is between him and the next guy. If Jared verse ends up being an elite edge rusher, if he ends up being Terrell Suggs light, you know, it doesn't have to be Hall of Famer, but like pro, perennial Pro Bowl, double team commanding edge rusher. Peyton Wilson ends up being a healthy player. Like, let's not even say he becomes like the top of his ceiling, but he, he doesn't he's not like a washout from an injury. Then how do you feel about this draft? If you know that that was the outcome, forgetting all the rest of the players, let's say that you don't hit an offensive guard like one of the guards doesn't work out. How do you feel about it? If you're getting, if you're pushing up into the Terrell Suggs area with Verse, I think you have to be fine with it. Because I think, like you were saying, Jeff, right? Like you, you trade down and you, you know, you take one of the other guys. And then the next year, if you were to try to trade for Jared Verse, you have to give up two firsts, right? So, like in reality, you would probably be happy to trade every pick after Verse that we took uh, and a first round pick to go get Verse in a year or two, right? Assuming he does anything. Um, but you know the reality, the the maybe the more likely outcome and still like uh, above average outcome is he's Cliff Averill, uh, mm -hmm. you know, or that level. So then, then how do you feel about it? And I think still good ish, but yeah, I, I don't know. What did the Panthers pass rusher Brian Burns net? How many? What? what is... A second and a, I think a fifth. I think it was the same as Leonard Williams trade. Mm -hmm. That's right. And That's right. He's getting paid though too. But they paid him thirty million a year, five years, I think. But that was because of his contract that he only went for. If they traded, he was offered two first two years ago, and the the Panther the Rams offered it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. What I like about that possibility is now Chenna Nuos is going to be better. Leonard Williams, I think, can be a, a much bigger factor than I think he already will be. Mafe can be better. Um, it just it, it can really morph the way a offense has to deal with the Seahawks. So I do like that. But um, oy. what's your grade? You hate this. My guy. grade, my grade on this is like a B minus. Oh, okay. It's a B minus. <laughs> Better than my like, C. I, I, I like Peyton Wilson more than than Jeff, so I I would be like I'd be nervous about it, but I I like upside guys, and he's certainly an upside guy. I think Mason Smith is also an upside guy, although I feel like it's not quite as exciting as I want it. He feels more like a Rasheem Green kind yeah, of upside guy. Yeah. Um. That's exactly what he is. 
so I'm not, it's not a draft that's going to, that's likely going to turn the Seahawks. That's going to break them out of being a mid team. So that's where it's, it's, it's not. Can, can they have that draft? I mean, I guess the way they get that draft is they get one of these trades to like 23 to 25 Murphy or whoever, one of these guys is still there. Cause there's a million quarterbacks and receivers. And then you find somebody with that second round pick. But I don't know yeah. that like this is going to be a, a future changing draft for Seattle. But who would have said that about the Rams draft last year? That's what they have to do. They have to hit on one of these third, fourth, fifth. Well, I don't have a fifth. So yeah, one of that's these. What's... Good. No, they they have to hit with one of these fourth round picks. Like if Peyton Wilson becomes KJ Wright and verse hits, that's a great draft. For this draft, the only possibility is Nathan saying they need something like that. Yeah, so, yeah. you need one of those. Like every year, you go and like you look back three years and you're like, oh, they took this guy over this guy, and then they took this guy over this guy. And like, I think, yeah, like the Rams basically had that perfect draft last year where they took every guy that you, every other team is sad about. Um, so like barring just nailing every pick but that's they didn't nail every pick but they had a really good solid draft it's like the the saints 2017 draft it's like the seahawks you know pick your 2010 11 12 uh draft whatever you'd like but we can we can kind of smirk about it like yeah that would be nice but that's kind of the deal like either they've got to do it or they're just going to be stuck because it yeah. was getting guys like even we don't talk about it. J.R. Sweezy, like was a quality starting guard that they got very late in a draft. Um, Malcolm Smith was a Super Bowl MVP that they got at the seventh in the seventh round. Robbed Cam of his. I don't know. MVP, but... yeah. You understand my point, though. I mean, Cam yeah. Chancellor, fifth round pick. Richard Sherman, fifth round pick. So. It's, we talk so much about the first rounders for a good reason, but the reality is if the Seahawks want to be anything more than what they've been, it is going to be picks past the first round that are going to determine whether that's the case, more so than what they do in the first round. 100%. Like Fred Warner, it was, a, I think, a third round, late third round pick. Greenlaw was a fifth round pick. You got to get those guys. Hufanga. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the first rounder is important. And Obviously, that gap in their draft is just so glaring right now. But, man, they need one of these third, fourth, six-round picks. Something has to hit for them or else. It's funny. Last year, when the Seahawks did visit with Byron Young, everyone was cringing because of his age. He's like a 24-year-old pass rusher. Guy's maxed out. <laughs> that would have been a lot better pick than Derek Hall. <laughs> Uh, yes. All right. Well, I'm going to let you guys go after that. That was actually, it was fun to, to kind of do each time we go through this, I learn a little bit more and I end up with a little bit of different questions. So it was great to hear your perspectives on it. Um, that was Nathan Ernst at Nathan E 11, Jeff Simmons at real Jeff Simmons. I'm Brian Nemhaus. You can find me at Hawk blogger and folks, if you haven't already given the show a like and click subscribe, please do. We are closing in on 10,000 subscribers on YouTube. Would love to get to 10,000 by the draft in only a couple couple weeks. That would be cool. And also go to patreon.com slash hawkblogger, sign up, get access to the Slack channel, get the audio version of all the podcasts. This podcast is, is going to be available for everybody. All of the Hawkblogger morning and other podcasts will only be available for Patreon members. And then finally... Click on the link that is pinned to the chat as well as available in the description of the video to become a YouTube member. And so if you do that, we'll get to know when you're asking questions or comments and we'll respond more quickly. Plus, there's a bunch of other bonus benefits uh, as well. So click and join as a YouTube member. That's a great thing to do. For Jeff Simmons, Nathan Ernst, Dana O'Gorman, I'm Brian M. Hazard. Thank you guys for tuning in for the 311th episode of Real Hawk Talk. Have a great rest of your night.